So clearly I survived the Ochiko Overlander, a four day semi-supported bike packing adventure deep in the Ochiko mountains of central Oregon. In this video, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that worked with my setup and some things I would have done differently. But before we get started, if you're into things like bike touring, bike packing, the supple life, you have found your people, hit that subscribe button. And if you like content like this, consider supporting the channel via Patreon. It really keeps all these videos coming. So if you saw my bike review of the Bear Claw Bow Jack Jackson, then you know it did pretty dang well. Survived the rigors of the Ochiko Overlander and did it with style and grace. But if I had a little bit more time with the bike, what would I change? First off, I think my choice of tire uh, was the right choice. You know, if it was any muddier or gnarlier, then a tire with more knobs would have been the right choice. But because it is largely uh, just gravel roads, a tire like this worked out pretty well. I know some of you are wondering what other people rode, uh, what I think would be a good tire for the event in general. This bike was definitely on the wider side of the tire spectrum. I think there was one other uh, plus size bike. Other than that, it was mostly, you know, mountain bikes with tires in the 2.4, 2.3 inch range, and also lots of tires in the 650B by 47. This is the third time we've ridden this event, and uh, the first time we rode it with our Warbirds, which had 700 by 45. Second time we rode it with our Cutthroats, and I was running 700 by 50. You can successfully do the Overlander uh, on a variety of widths of tires. It really depends on your skill level and how comfortable you want to be. I think if I were to do it again next year, I'd probably take uh, the Crest Bambora that I'm still tweaking and I would run 650B by 2.3. And I think that's a good happy spot. Uh, not so big that it gets uh, laggy on the, the smooth stuff, but not so under gun where, you know, descending Chender Mountain would be uncomfortable. Moving right along, I think the gearing uh, was pretty good. If this were my personal bike, I would probably swap the cassette to an 1146 and change the chain ring from the 32 to something like a 34 or 36. So I would have a little bit more top end, but similar low end. And I think that would be just about, uh, you know, perfect gearing for me uh, for this event. Probably the biggest thing I would change about uh, this bike, if I were to do it again, would be to use the titanium fork. And no, it's not just because I like shiny metal things, although that is part of it, but I would have liked the option to run a uh, front rack or even a basket. This carbon fork, I don't believe is rated to take a front rack. So that's kind of its downside here. But I do believe the uh, tie version, you know, aside from being uh, more supple and more blingy, it does offer actual functionality in terms of running a front rack. So let's talk a little bit about bags and racks here. Uh, if you saw my quote unquote training videos with the cutthroat, uh, you guys probably noticed I was running the Ocean Air Cycles Erlen rack to support the Caradice bag. At the 11th hour, I decided to not use the Erlen and instead use this new tumbleweed uh, T-Rack. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, Tumbleweed, they make the Prospector bike, uh, but they've also taken over production of the T-Rack and it's kind of a minimalist uh, rear rack slash bag support. And why I chose this over the Erlen, because I knew that the bike was gonna have plus tires, the Erlen, given the rough terrain, would have probably bounced and hit the top. So I need something a little bit more stable and more supportive and went with a T-Rack. I think one of the main value propositions of this rack is that it has integrated uh, three pack mounts. So you could theoretically run an anything cage back here or even water bottles. I didn't do that, but that's one of the main reasons to get this rack over something like the a tubus rack. I also feel like it's generally wider, easier to kind of squeeze on uh, bikes that have plus size tires. So speaking of bags, let's move on to that. So like I mentioned, I had a, a Caradice on the back corded by the T-Rack and I'm not sure which model this is. It might be the Barley. It's basically smaller than the Camper long flap although it does still have the long flap option. So this worked great with uh, the bike. Um, you know, the saddle I was using was a Physique Aliante and it had the Hobo Pieces rest of us, which added saddle loops. So this connected directly to the saddle, rested on the rack. In here, uh, I had my tent, um, I had my sleeping pad, my pillow, and a spare layer. And I also had some spare straps in these side pockets which came in handy in the video, as you saw. So overall, I think this was a good choice. Of course, I could have run the larger camper long flap, but I was trying to be minimalist, or at least minimalist for me. Uh, so this worked out well. Let's talk about frame bag for a second. Uh, when I was doing the training videos with the Salsa Cutthroat, I was using the Blackburn, um, I think this is their Expert Pro, whatever, uh, frame bag, which I actually really like. I like the space, the volume, the zippers. You know, it's got two tier zippers. It's got all these external pockets. It's got another kind of compartment here. However, 
At, again, at the 11th hour, I decided not to use this and instead use uh, this Ortley bag, this Ortley frame bag, which as you can see, uh, only has one large zipper, uh, no small zippers, no external pocket, pretty minimal compared to the Blackburn. So what made me switch from the Blackburn to the Ortlieb at the 11th hour. And uh, it, honestly, it had to do with the zippers. I found that these were starting to bind even with little use. And I knew that I wanted the frame bag to uh, carry a windbreaker or some camera batteries. And I would be getting into it uh, fairly often during the day and probably while I was riding. So I didn't want a bag where I had to kind of baby the zippers. So yeah, so I decided not to use this one. And I switched to the Ortlieb ones, which have a very kind of you know, big gauge zipper, easy to open, easy to close, although it does lose a lot of organization. So another bag from Blackburn I used on the trip was their top two bag. Uh, it's a cool little bag in camo. And again, um, what, I, what I like about this bag is that uh, it's got lots of compartments. There's a little mesh pocket up here, another little mini uh, compartment here, fairly adjustable uh, strap system so you can dial it on your bike. Ultimately, uh, what was driving me mad, this was constantly tipping on its side. And also, again, with the zippers, these were kind of a little sticky to, to ride with, to open while riding. And in here, I was keeping my Sony camera, so I needed quick access all the time. What I found myself actually doing was, was riding with this top two bag almost nearly open most of the time, just so I can quickly grab the camera, you know, do a quick piece of camera and stick it back in here. And the second we got back to Primeville and Good Bike, they had one of these guys. So this is the Revelate, uh, I think it's called the Maglock top two bag. Just like it sounds, it uses a magnetic closure, super easy one-handed uh, operation. So I bought this uh, to replace this guy for future trips. Mostly love this, but by the end of four days, it drove me nuts and I ended up buying this. Okay guys, so let's talk about this guy. This is the Bags by Bird Caradise style bag. Yes, it's kind of based on that old school saddle bag, but it also offers lots of improvements in terms of material, in terms of other features, like uh, all these places to tie things on, the second dowel to give it structure, all these molly strap webbing loops sewn on here so you can secure it to a rear or front rack. Looks similar, but not the same. I do believe that this is a vast improvement over the traditional Caradice. That's coming from someone that loves a Caradice bag that has a camper long flapper over a decade, has that small barley for a number of years. I do believe that this is a better bag in my opinion. So how did this work out? So as you've seen in the training videos and in the Ochiko Overlander, I connected this to the front of my bike. At the beginning of the trip, the, the bag was clearing the, the really big uh, plus size tire quite fine. But by the end of the second day, it was I was starting to get tire rub and I, I couldn't tell if that was from the volley strap stretching or these, uh, these, or these spacer blocks compressing. I had assumed it was a volley strap. And as you guys saw, I fixed it by using some John's Irish straps just to kind of lift up the entire bag. The downside of that, of course, is that it was a little bit tougher to get into the bag because I had to undo the, those straps and undo these straps. But I chose that inconvenience uh, for the sake of this not rubbing on the tire. Overall, however, I do love this bag. I prefer this much more uh, compared to the quote unquote traditional bike packing sausage roll. For one, a lot more capacity, a lot more volume, easier to pack, easier to get into. You're not just like jamming things into like a big sausage casing. And plus when it's relatively empty or empty, it still holds its form. It's not this big kind of flaccid thing uh, on the front of your bike. I think as more people get a chance to experience this kind of setup, they will migrate from the sausage casing to something like this. It offers kind of the same, you know, minimal packing uh, opportunities of the handlebar roll, but way more functionality, way more useful for everyday use. I actually commute with this now. It does fit my uh, small MacBook, and that's something you can't do with like a sausage roll. So what did I put in this bag? I, I put in my, my quilt, uh, some layers, uh, some camera gear, my watercolor kit at some point, mostly jackets and puffies, things that I would need to access throughout the day. Uh, lots of room for snacks and also camera batteries and all those accessories. If I had to choose between the sausage roll and this, this hands down, no questions asked. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, you have to wait. Yes, there are some things you have to work out like a handlebar, a tire clearance. But if you can get it to work on your bike, guys, this 
this is my favorite way to pack right now. In terms of camping gear, I don't have it with me, so I'm just gonna make word sounds here. The tent I used was the Tarp Tent DW Moment, and uh, as you guys saw, I decided to leave the supportive struts in there, and that made a big difference getting into camp, especially on day one after a 70 mile day, just setting up the tent without having to faff about with the supportive struts. So tent worked awesome. We had light rain. Uh, I didn't get wet. One thing I discovered is that there's actually a, a fair amount of separation between the mesh inner and the single wall outer. So there was like, there, there was no risk at any point of uh, the mesh touching the outer wall and leaching the water through. So I thought that was great. It was awesome. Only used two stakes uh, to secure the whole tent down. So that was impressive. Uh, it wasn't super windy. It wasn't a super hard rain. So uh, time will tell how it works under more challenging weather conditions. In terms of my sleeping system, you know, I was using the Enlightened Equipment a 10 degree uh, quilt and that worked out great. But, but again, some kind of learning curve using the quilt, uh, trying to figure out the happy spot of, of where to put those straps, how much to tuck the quilt uh, around me. But for the most part, I was pretty warm. Uh, one night got chilly and I did kind of deploy the toe box and that worked out great. If there is one downside to the quilt is that uh, because you are laying directly on the sleeping pad, it's a little bit noisy. It's a little bit scratchy and I, I tend to roll, roll around a lot when I sleep. So I felt bad for kind of my camping neighbors because all they heard was this scratching sound all night long. Other bit of uh, camping gear I used uh, that I would probably like to change if I can is my sleeping pad. It's a big Agnes, big air core, something. It's orange and it's big. And it's not so much because it's not comfortable or doesn't work well with the quilt. It's just, I hate blowing that thing up. I was really envious of some folks who had uh, sleeping pads where they had big inflation bags. Because think about it, first night, 70 miles, super tired. I'm practically passing out twice just inflating the sleeping pad. So for a future upgrade, I would like to get a sleeping pad where it comes with some kind of bag that you catch air in and, and bellow and bellows. Is that even a verb? Uh, and bellow air into the sleeping pad. In terms of electronics, this was kind of the, the first big multi-day trip that I used the Sony uh, FDR-X3000 camera to film with. And I have to say I'm pretty stoked. I mean, you guys saw the Ochiko videos, the audio is crystal clear and is absolutely amazing for an action cam. In my opinion, does not need an external mic, does need uh, a big kind of substantial wind muff here. A little bit of a learning curve, uh, knowing what the field of view is. I found that I had to aim a little bit lower than, than, I, than I thought. Otherwise, I would just have the head at the bottom third of the camera, so I was aiming for the chest. But as I use this more, this is becoming uh, my favorite uh, vlogging camera for lack of better terms. Way more reliable than the GoPro, better audio, always turns on, always turns off. Other than that, I had a small GoPro Hero session that I ran on the Chessie Cam to get that other B-roll footage. Uh, I know there was a question somewhere, I think it was on Instagram, about how I kept things charged, and I used this guy. It is a RAV Power uh, battery, just under 27,000 milliamp hours, and I got this one specifically, you know, it's high capacity. It charges via USB-C, you know, using uh, kind of that brick that the MacBook uses. I mean, the point is lots of options. You can power your laptop, charge your phone, you know, multiple times over multiple days, or like me, uh, charge my phone, the Wahoo, and uh, all the camera batteries I had. Overall, everything worked out pretty well. There was no like catastrophic failure. If you guys are curious about any of this gear, I'm gonna put links in the description below. If you guys have any other questions, leave those in the comments. And if you like this content, consider supporting the channel via PayPal and Patreon. And as always, keep the supple side down.